All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. All right, to this track, we have James Rissler, CISSP and CCIE, uh, number 15412. He's a systems engineer and manager of security content development at Cisco Systems. His focus is on security, technology, and training development. Um, and he will be discussing the role of the security analyst and how they can help identify an attack. There will be questions afterwards, so if you want to hold those until the end. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming. I really appreciate it. Um, what I'm going to try to uh, explain to you is I've been doing this research for about almost five years now, talking to a lot of companies, talking to actually people inside of Cisco, and it's amazing how many people I find out there aren't really aware of what this job is and why companies need this person inside their company. And we have a team at Cisco, and so I kind of lumped this together. This is an all-inclusive bucket. Security analyst to one company may mean something to another, but you'll see the specifics that I'm trying to get to on the slide. So it's a little bit about me, 20 years of networking security experience. Some of you in here have worked with me on different things, so don't hold that against me. <laughs> CISSP, uh, 10 years of uh, Cisco security instruction. Um, I did DNS consulting, voice over IP consulting, and uh, security consulting, of course. I've got an MBA in information technology. I'm a current MS cybersecurity student at USF. Um, I, I just always, I'm always taking classes. Uh, it, my boss jokes about it. How many classes are you taking this year? What are you taking them in? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. No. So I manage the uh, security content development team. So if any of you are really pissed off about the CCNA and CCMP security, come yell at me. I'm, I'm got thick skin, I can take it. So they're, they're my tracks. All right, so we're gonna talk about the why, the threat landscape, the complex threat puzzle we face today. Um, the phases of attacks, we'll look at the a not well-known attack. It's a North Korean attack on South Korean think tanks. And I'm, I use that to set the stage and then I jump into the target attack because I really want to talk about the kill chain and why companies are missing this over and over and over again. Companies like Target that had FireEye, uh, why didn't they pick up on it? And it's going to be a common theme that you'll see. Um, we'll talk about the business challenge because ultimately it all comes down to the fact that we're here because our companies do business, they're trying to make money, they're trying to employ people, and yet somebody out there is actively trying to exploit that and get money out of them or uh, intellectual property. So we'll talk about the security analyst, and then we'll conclude with the Q&A. So do, do I need to say any more? I mean, this is why we're all here. It's pretty common. And this isn't even the latest one. So if you go to the link, they have the uh, Anthem insurance company on there. Our IDs are being, uh, being hacked. Uh, how many of you in here had your uh, ID or any? Have, how many of you been here hacked? Yeah. Well, if, for those who didn't raise your hand, you probably have. You just don't know it. So, um, found out because uh, my credit card company called me. Strange, strange charge, and I ended up tracing it back to a company that I purchased some coffee from in the Midwest. They were hacked, and their credit cards were dumped out of their system because they weren't PCI compliant. Thank you very much. So uh, we see this every day. Every day we hear about these problems. It's, it's, pretty, it's getting ri ridiculous. And we need to start talk, having the conversation to stop this. And companies need to know that they can, they can stop this, at least mitigate it, if they start looking for it. And that's what I'm trying to convince people to do is to look for it. So here's my boss. He and I are like this. We hang out on his plane. Yeah. Uh, so John has to say something here to you, and it's, it's not if you've been hacked, but you just don't know you have. And uh, a lot of people say it around Cisco, because believe it or not, Cisco's probably been hacked. Um, every company has, and if you haven't been, you will be, or currently are being hacked. So our chief security officer, John Stewart, he's an interesting guy. Uh, he put this quote out there, and I really liked it, and I've seen him speak multiple times. Uh, he's a thinker when it comes to about the problem that we face today, and he, he's a geek too, which I like. 
So we have to understand the, the attacker's mindset of what they're doing before, during, and after the attack, and their motivations wrapped around that. Why are they attacking us? Um, and how do we stop it? There's something in your company that they want. And if you prevent them from getting to that by thinking about the kill chain and getting into their mindset, you're already going much further than a lot of other companies do. And trust me, I've talked to a lot of friends of mine that I've been in the Tampa Bay area for over 20 years. I've done a lot of consulting, traveled around the world. I've seen a lot of companies that are just really messed up. And it's just they don't have the money and they don't want to put the effort into it. So trust me, you're not alone if you think your company's messed up because I guarantee the person next door to you is just as bad. And you're just probably hoping that they get hacked before you do. Uh, do you think Home Depot thought they were going to get hacked? Probably not. They went, oh, we're protected. Yeah, same exact hack went after Home Depot that went after Target. So remember back the good old days of Novell networking, early two th before 2000? Then we got worms. Then worms begot spyware and root kits. Well, what happened next? After 2005, around 2008, a nasty little thing came out called Conficker. And Conficker changed the game. And it changed the game so dynamically, it's what led to 2010 and a little old thing called Stuxnet. And so I'm going to talk about Conficker and why the game changed. What I'm trying to do is set a stage for you that if you think about what happened in 2000 with the email, I love you, and then the spyware, what started happening with that, and then when Conficker, and you start seeing a pattern. No matter how hard you try, they're changing. Hackers today have antivirus software. They have Cisco IDSs, Splunk, running, and they test their attacks out in those environments. So they have replicated your environment probably better than you have, and they are testing their tools out in those environments. So how do you stay one step ahead? And then you know, my favorite is here we have increased attack surfaces. I saw that picture this morning with the refrigerator on it, and my first thought was, I know somebody's going to shut my refrigerator off and all my milk and my I'm gonna, water's going to be all over the place. It's coming. So IoT. Internet of Things increases the attack vectors. It gives us more ability to attack things. All right, so there's the I love you in the early 2000, Anna Kornikova. How do we solve that? We solve that with firewalls. Okay, then NIMDA, SQL Slammer, the start of Conficker, and how do we solve those? We did intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. All right, now we got uh, Tedru. Uh, Conficker Part 2, or they know as Conficker B if you look it up, which are botnets, and we use reputation uh, filters, email filters, you know, things like that. And now we have directed advanced persistent attacks, Shady, Root, Shady Rat, Aurora, Dooku, and Stuxnet. So how many of you are aware of what Stuxnet did? Okay, for those who aren't, Stuxnet was was a piece of code designed to look for one thing, semen controller chips attached to Pakistani centrifuge devices. Hmm, wonder who had those. Only one place in the world had those. That place was air-gapped, but they got them into it. Think about how. Us, people, we're the weak link, people. We are the weak link in this entire chain. And that's what you got to think about. Your employees who come to work every day, log into your network, are your weak link. They are bringing things in. They are clicking on links. They are starting the attacks. And you've got to educate them as well as protect yourself from them in some regards. Limit what they have access to. OK, so Config was pretty interesting because it was a zero-day attack. Microsoft found the exploit pretty quickly and patched it. But what do we know about 10% of the machines in the world that are running Microsoft operating system? They can't be patched because they're stolen software. China's just littered with it. So those are great machines to take over because then you can use those to target your attacks against somebody else. I think the uh, Danish government broke up a 10,000 node botnet network 
of just devices used to attack people. So, and the next time that a war breaks out, it's not only going to break out with bombs, it's going to break out with uh, uh, attacks like this. Somebody's going to create worms and different attacks to go out there. So Comficker also did a phone home process. So that was kind of new at that time. It, during the phone home process, it generated 250 domain names about every 35 to 60 minutes, somewhere in there. But it was about eight times a day. And it would use the universal time clock to spin that up. So it's about eight guys figured out all those domain names that they would generate each day. And they started calculating ahead and going out and registering those domain names and redirecting them to a bit bucket at Georgia Tech, trying to figure out what kind of machines and track all the machines that were being attacked. So just eight guys. They weren't hired by the government. They were just doing it because it was of interest to them. Um, once it installed on the machine, it patched its own the, the Microsoft bug, it installed itself and then fixed the hole it came in on so nobody else could come in. So, so if they looked, the machine would look fine. Then they disabled, reconfigured, turned off other features, to, um, blocked and patched, it blocked the antivirus. It would download another antivirus, but it was a bogus antivirus. It turned on RPC attack vectors, then pivoted sideways looking for other computers to attack with the same issue so it could get on multiple machines. And then uh, after it did that, it, when it communicated back out, here's the cool thing. They were using a cryptological support package that was state of the art, that wasn't even fully approved by NIST or anybody yet. So you knew those authors of this attack were not amateurs. They were a well-grouped, well-funded group of professionals that were doing this. All right. When you see attacks today, the com common underlying attacks fall into pretty much three areas. A lot of people will debate me on that. This whole thing is debatable. But social engineering. Most attacks, like the target attacks, started with social engineering. Phishing. And now they're not just doing the standard spam now they're doing a new form of spam, snowshoe spam. Remember what snowshoes are? They're really long, so you can walk on snow and distribute your weight. That's snowshoe spam. So they send one email from a thousand machines instead of a thousand emails from one machine. So now it's hard for software like Cisco's ESA or somebody else's product to filter on those type of spam messages coming in. So they're raising their game. Every time we turn something off, they turn around and come up with a new, new strategy. Technical exploits, they're looking for machines that aren't patched, that even vendors say, hey, we, we've got a bug here, and then they look to exploit that. And finally, the zero-day attacks are kind of hard. It means that they have to work really hard to find those, and that's a, it's a lot easier for them to do the first two than go after the zero-day because the zero day is extremely hard, but I know it scares a lot of people. Okay, so let's look at the uh, Kaminsky attack here. So who doesn't want Korea and Peninsula to unify? North and South, tear down that wall, shake hands. I know West Virginia and Virginia are still at war. Nobody? All right. <laughs> Maybe it's late in the afternoon. You're Lunches are still sitting with you. I'll, I'll chalk that one up. So, um, so South Korea has been, four think tanks in South Korea have been spending millions and millions of dollars every year to unify and try to put a lot of pressure on the North to unify the peninsula. And one of the major companies that wants this to happen is Hyundai Merchant Marine. So South, North Korea said we need to find out what they're doing and counteract everything they're doing. So if they're spending their money here, we spend our money here to counteract what they're doing. So they went after Hyundai Merchant Marine by basically doing a public search. They found everybody in the company, the hierarchy of the entire company, all the people in the company, probably phone called them up, asked, asked some names, and then built that whole hierarchy and then started their targeted phishing attack. So let's say I know him. I might know him. 
and they sent me, and we work at the same company, sent an email to him, it looks like it comes from me, hoping that he'll click on the link. And they just tried all those combinations until they were in. Only took one machine, then they installed their tro Trojan dropper on there. Installed some DLL software. Got keystroker, directory listing, remote control execution, and remote control access on the machine. All installed the machine, then turned off the firewall and installed their applications. Then disabled their antivirus. So those should have been logs generated off that machine. Or the user should have seen, hey, why's my, why's my firewall turned off? But here's what was interesting. Instead of just FTPing the data out of the network, because every time that person on that machine brought up a Word doc, and I know they weren't using Word, they were using something else, the, it, the, what the uh, machine attack would do was it would take that document and copy it into another directory, and then it would encrypt it through RC4, and then at night it would email it out to a Bulgarian web server, uh, email server. Why Bulgarian? Because if they went right to North Korea, it would be picked up pretty quick. But they should have picked it up. In, think about the attack chain. Was anybody at Hyundai Merchant Marine doing work with people in Bulgaria? Why would they be emailing out? Why was this happening late at night? And why was the payload so large? Somebody should have been seeing that. Actually, they did pick it up within about 45 days. So that's relatively fast because today what I hear is most attacks aren't found for nine months. So people are in your network for over nine months before you figure out you're being attacked. So now let's, let's take the target attack case. There's a, if you look for the 11 phases of the uh, target attack, this company called a Regato or something like that did a really nice write-up. This is what you should be doing if you're a security professional. You should be reading these cases and then mentally putting yourself in the position say, let's pretend this is our company. This is my company that's just been hacked or is a target. How can they come at my company that I work for and get paid a paycheck and execute this kind of stuff? If I was going to attack my company, where would I go? What are the assets? And you have to start thinking like that. When you start thinking like that, you're now taking a positive approach to a big problem. But there's a lot, trust me, there's a lot of people out there when I ask them about security, I, I have meetings with people, I'm like, what are you doing today for your security? Are you looking at your logs? Well, we're collecting our logs. Are you looking at your logs? Well, we're collecting our logs. No, no, no. Questions. Is there anybody who's actively looking through logs? Uh, no. So, so, number one, we heard earlier that they fished the HVAC company. Once they were in the HVAC company with those stolen credentials that they got, they found that they had a link to a target SQL server and ticketing server. So then they attacked those. Now, target probably didn't patch those. Why? Because they probably weren't on the internet. Might have been a VPN tunnel. Remember, you're, now your partner, now you're thinking. I see some people's eyes going, whoa. My partner companies are now becoming part of my problem. Yeah, they're helping me. This HVAC company is helping Target, but they weren't really helping them always in the right way. So in this case, you have to think about the partner companies you're working with as being part of the, your concerns. You know, what traffic's coming across that VPN tunnel? What traffic's remote desktoping into your network? If a user's at home, um, an executive, and he's been targeted, they might not go after him, but his kids. Put something that his kids will click on to get onto that computer so that he carries it in. If you look, start looking at attacks like the RSA attack, when they stole the cryptography key for RSA, how did they get onto that executive's machine? If you look back through it, somebody clicked on something and it got to them. Okay, so once they got into the HVAC, they uploaded a PHP to the web server that was their ticketing server. Then they scanned for a SQL server very easily using the actual machine. They, the name of the machine was SQL Server. Didn't take much to figure that one out. Um, then they started attacking the AD domain because they owned the SQL Server and they used pass the hash. How many went to the USF Cyber Conference in the fall last year? 
Anybody? So this fall, USF's going to have a cyber conference again on campus. They brought in an expert. He ran past the hash on a, a network that he had somebody set up at his company. He said, set it up, secure it, and uh, I'll attack it and break it. And he was into it within two minutes using pass the hash. So once they got in, they promoted themselves using pass the hash to AD. So think about the attack chain. I just promoted myself to a administrator of my Microsoft Active Directory domain. Isn't that going to generate a log? Isn't somebody like, hey, why this log just, somebody just became an administrator. What is this account doing and who promoted it to administrator? Ask some questions. Nobody asked. Then they said, hey, we'll install Angry IP Scanner. Hey, we'll tunnel using PS exec. Hey, we'll do SQL attacks. Steal 70 million PII records. So Target got lucky on that one when they downloaded these three utilities, put them on the machine, and attacked and stole 70 million uh, customer records, there was no credit card information. They went. So how long do you think this was going on for in Target's network? So once they were in there, all right, then they downloaded, they said, okay, we didn't get credit card information from going after the SQL database, so where are we gonna go? POS. Nobody's been thinking about, and I used to work with a major restaurant chain up in Orlando that people buy a lot of tchotchke stuff at that restaurant chain. Nobody's thinking about the POS machines, but that's always been a weak link, and I knew it, and I was always saying, there's no security on these things. You're not encrypting anything. Of course, they downloaded this tool called Captoxia, and next thing you know, that malware tool was on the POS machines and they were just siphoning off credit card information. So let's go back. Let's think about the kill chain. They should have stopped the problem right there at number four. They should have seen the scan. They should have actually seen it at number three when somebody installed something on that machine through the PHP script attack. But number five is when they really should have gotten it. Five and six, when they were scanning the network and promoting themselves to AD, they were making a lot of noise on the network, but people weren't looking. Probably not using NetFlow and probably didn't have logging turned on or just weren't looking at the logs. Most common thing I see is people tell me, yeah, I have IDS running. Yeah, where's your IDS administrator? I don't have one. And then it's useless. All right, and then finally they should have gotten it by looking at the traffic going out of their network. What do you think the biggest weak link in your information data to finding out if you've been hacked could be in your network for outbound traffic? DNS. Keep your DNS server inside your network. Don't use 8.8.8.8. .8 use your own DNS server. Run logs. Because if you see traffic going out of your network to North Korea, Looking up North Korean IP addresses, I think they only have a thousand. They might, I may, are they still turned on? Anybody know? <laughs> um, then you know that you have some traffic you have to go back and investigate, get forensic on. So, why are we here? You know, this is really a business problem. It's really a business problem because these hackers want to steal your information to sell, or they want to steal your money. They want to, you, or, knock you out of business because you're in the way. So we have industrialization of hackers today. Remember when, uh, who are those guys that uh, hung out in New York and squatted on Wall Street, what are they called? Occupy, yeah. Remember how Occupy started squatting and then uh, people started trying to stop them and then Anonymous came out and started hacking all those people? And then Occupy pissed off Anonymous and Anonymous said, whoo, uh, we're going to hack you back. So sometimes your friend, like Anonymous, who's helping you out, may turn on you. So those are some of the things that we have going on today. You think North Korea is not working with the uh, Iranians on hacking? I'm sure that they are in some areas. I'm sure that the Iranians also hacking them and other people, including us. Evolving borders, BYOD. How many heard your executives say, in your company or people say, we're doing BYOD. Yeah. 
Exactly. That means now you have more attack vectors because what are people doing? They're bringing in their phones. Raise your phone up. They're bringing in these to their network. These now, these IP phones are now an attack vector. It's now a point where somebody can use to jump into your network and exploit. And that's what we're really here about to talk about. And then we're all, some of us are dealing with uh, the rapid compliance SOX, HIPAA, you know, PCI, ISO. So the problem is, uh, is pretty, it's not if you're going to be targeted. Sorry to use the word target again for those who like target. But not if, but when you'll be hacked, because you will be hacked. It's just how fast can you identify it and mitigate it. And uh, you don't think, I, I guarantee they're trying to hack Cisco. I mean, our network's like the wild, wild west uh, inside our network. But that's why we have teams of people, which you'll see what, what I'm talking about. So business breaches will happen. So Cisco did a study last year. They went into 30 companies, got them to sign off, and said, can we look at your networks for hacks? Out of those 30 companies, every one of them had a hack running through their network. They were 30 for 30. The CIO, they were big companies, too. The CIOs were not happy. But I, I think it's just it's getting almost, almost impossible to keep it off your network. It's just how fast can you find it. So you need to start planning before, during, and after the hack. All right? I love this. Uh, do you guys read, like, the Verizon security reports or the Cisco one or the other ones out there? Those are filled, chucked with information. We have about, I lost track, I'd say over 500 people at Cisco that just work on being security researchers, analysts, you know, looking at other companies' security, looking at Cisco's, and then they bring that information together. So all that data in the report is what we learn on our network, what we learn from our customers, what's reported back to us. Um, so it's pretty interesting, but here's what I find so funny about it is, in small companies, only 22% of the respondents see that, secure, that security is a high priority. You kidding me? That's min being minimally observant. If you turn the TV on for 10 minutes on the news, you should be knowing you have a bigger problem than that. I just gave a speech to some uh, small credit unions and leaders of these credit unions, and they were just completely oblivious about security. I mean, executives need to be hearing this every day. But believe it or not, they're not. And another interesting one is CISOs and their ops managers running their SOC department are not even on the same page. And then 50% of the respondents in our, in our survey that Cisco did for the report, you know, uh, did not have administrator or user priv uh, provisioning, patching or configuration management, endpoint forensic tools like we've seen here, or vulnerability scanning. It's like you, you have to start protecting your keys to your vault. And then my favorite, only 40% of companies do cor correlation event log analysis. That's what we're here about, and that's what I want to start seeing companies doing. Why won't they hire it? Because it's finding those people is hard and they're expensive. You can't outsource that to India or somewhere else. You have to do it. And there's so much data coming in. Cisco touches 1.5 trillion terabytes of data a day. Trillion bytes of data a day. Yeah, whatever, you get what I'm saying. So what I want you to start thinking about is the attack continuum. I want you to start thinking about before, what you can do. And remember, it's a people problem, but you need to align your people with your processes and your policies. Build that up and then start looking. Start monitoring out there, identifying data, identifying trends. Are you baselining network traffic? One o'clock in the morning, we have 2% of network activity. Except for Tuesday and Thursday night, we all of a sudden have 13% network activity going out of our network. Hmm, what's going on? Why aren't we looking at this? Impact mitigation, your communication strategy. Target wasn't ready. Home Depot, a little bit better, but still not ready. Now they've got 40 lawsuits out against them. 
And by the way, you get free uh, identity checking if you were a target victim or not a target victim. Just sign up for it. So what is a security analyst? And this is kind of like a bucket. I just, I just threw stuff in it, but I did some research to figure out what a security analyst was. I sat down with the guys at Cisco. We have a team in Austin, Columbia, Maryland, where SourceFire was, and San Jose. And then it kind of follows the sun in our, our Australia uh, data center there. There's a team there. So we kind of have coverage in Belgium, all over the place. And I sat down with them, and then I asked them to take me through their typical day. Because I, 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 as a, a developer of education, I want to figure out, can I create courses that people can consume and become this person? What would it take for me to go from zero to a security analyst, to work in a SOC, to start reading that data? That's my mindset. I'm thinking like that. What's my end goal? Train people to do that job role. So let's look at the skills, the process they go through, the function, the models. Um, the job role specifically in the examples. I'll take a pause here. Is there any questions? Is that a yes or a no? Maybe. Hey, you guys are talkers. So we'll take this up to the last minute because I know I'm not going to get any questions. All right. Sorry, I'm making fun of you guys. But I think you're enjoying every second of it. Okay, you might. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned that there was a gap between the, the CISO and the tech ops manager. Uh -huh. what, what gap are you referring to? Uh, so the question was, is there a gap? What's the gap between the CISO and the tech ops manager? Well, the CISO thinks that they're more protected than the security ops manager does, and they're off by about 18%. So if they had to rank, let's say the CISO says, I'm about an 8 out of 10 secure. And the SecOps manager says, no, we're really down at a five. <laughs> so the daily day guy sees the blood and, the, and the, the tax coming in. He knows the reality. The CSOP manager isn't getting the reality, probably because he's too busy playing up at the politics level of trying to get money and stuff like that. Good question. All right, so this is the team at Cisco. And uh, I got a couple of slides on this. So we have a bunch of analysts at Cisco. Um, you come in, you have just a basic CCNA. They kind of they mentor you in to this job. They teach you the tools. A lot of them are shareware tools, free tools that you can get off the internet. They teach you how to take Wireshark PCAP and really drill down on packet, packets. I've had them send me a bunch of PCAPs, and they send them to me, and they say, find the attack. So I'm like going through the PCAP, and finally I give up, and they go, go to this line in the PCAP file. I'm like, yeah, I see it. I can't see anything in there. He goes, take a look at this line of code. Oh, yeah, OK. Is it this? He goes, well, you're close. It's new. It's this. So that's what the, they teach the analysts to do. The investigators are the guys who rise up through that rank. And they're sent off to basically, when the analyst sees something that comes through, he goes, I've never seen this before. I'm concerned. This might be an attack. He pushes it over to the investigator. If the investigator finds it is an attack but may need more research, he'll kick it up to the intel and research guys, and they'll go out there and document it. And then they put it out on our Cisco website. If you go to cisco.com slash go SIO, um, that's where they dump all the data out to that they find. So every time they find a hack, they put it out there because they want to ed educate you guys. So it's a great place to read. And when the guys burn out in one of those roles, they may roll them off to where they build tools, develop scripts and other tools to basically parse through all that data that they get. And they get so much data, it's just insane. So this is another slide looking at our SOC Operations Center. You know, intelligence and research generates, there might be an APT. The investigators are looking. They generate data back and forth. The analysts are pumping over to investigation. And look at all the green tools that they're using, the network log, system log, user attribution, analyst tools, case, deep packet analysis. All that's being fed up to the investigators so that they can correlate that data together to figure out what's going on. Because hackers have gotten smart. They don't just come in and make a bunch of noise anymore. They come in and very stealthily move through your network 
and do it in such a way that they know they won't generate any alarms. They want to be under the covers. They want to be in there for a while. And they're hoping you're not looking. Okay, so part of my research, I used NIST. Uh, NIST has a, our National Institute of Science and Technology, has a, a event, a conference that occurs every fall called the NICE Conference, the National Initiative on Cyber Education. They also put together a framework on job roles. So if you're trying to hire for your company, I put this in here, go to nist.gov slash nice, and you can download this framework, and it'll literally tell you different job roles that people could be doing inside your company. An investigator, what he does. A forensic analyst, what he does. And then you can literally go to your boss and say, we need somebody doing this role right here. This is what their job task is. Makes it easier for your HR department because they struggle anyways. Um, so the whole idea with this NICE framework was to help students have a clear understanding of potential jobs. They found that when they did the survey in the government that this department right here and that department right there had the guy doing the same exact job but two different titles. So they wanted to standardize that. So they're trying to help us. Help policymakers promote job growth and assist employees with skill development, employers with skill development. So there's four things that a security analyst has to do and deal with to find on his network right now. And, and bloody, this is changing. So I could be like five minutes late because there could be already another one ready to add to this list. Uh, advanced persistent threats. They have to detect them on the network. So it's a constant battle. And you're not Clouseau, okay? So you need to be a little bit smarter than that. And Cato's out there ready to attack you. I just dated myself. Did anybody get that reference? Okay, good, good. <laughs> All right, so uncovering reconnaissance. A lot of what you get is people knocking at your front door, running net scan and different scans, um, looking to see what you have open on your web servers. How is malware spreading across your network? Are you looking for that? All right, and finally, do you have command and control activity going out of your network? One of the ways you can find out is go to your DNS logs. See where people are going to. Look at, for things that look unusual in your DNS logs. Here's the problem. You can have the greatest perimeter in the world. You have the best locks on your front door, a firewall. I don't care if it's Juniper, Palo Alto, whoever. You can have IPS, network antivirus, web security, email security. You can go out and buy these things. They're just not the whoopee that's going to keep you safe at night. All right? They're coming in because people are bringing them in. They're salting the parking lot with USB sticks. They just take them, throw them in the parking lot. Somebody picks up, hey, a free USB stick. I think I'll plug it in at work. They do that. I swear they do that. I've heard more stories, I've forgotten half of them, but I have CRS anyway, so. But BYOD, people are bringing it into their network. So, the problem we're facing, key challenges. It's complex threat and visibility. You've been breached, pretend you've been breached. Say, I've been breached, I gotta go find it. Who, where, and how do they breach you? Very difficult to find. The context is critical. You have to start stitching together their traffic patterns, stitching together what they're attacking in your network. It might not just be your firewall log. Firewall logs actually aren't that good. We don't use fire log, firewall logs at Cisco. Too much data. We use snort logs. We use uh, email logs. We do use DNS. And then we do a lot with NetFlow. A lot with NetFlow. NetFlow stitches together traffic patterns so that you can see this IP called this IP. Then we, manu for a while there, we have tools now, but for a while there we did a lot of manually assembly. We took those logs and we started correlating events around times in different areas. Remember, what are they going after? They're going after your assets. All right, so here's an example of a Complex threat visibility. Imagine where you have thousands of bits and streams of traffic, active flows. Let's say you have 23,000 active flows 
streaming past your screen every second. And buried in there, you have one person who's FTPing out of the network to Uzbekistan. Why are we doing, tra what? who are we doing business with in Uzbekistan? Probably nobody. That's something you've got to investigate. But does your policy in your company tell the people they need to investigate that? Does your policy and processes flag that? Probably not. That's what needs to be happening. You need to be flagging that stuff and having it percolate up so where an investigator can go look at it and figure out what it was all about. And then put some context around it. Here we see Pat Smith. God, she's, she's such a pain. That Pat Smith, there's one at Cisco too. She's, at, oh, she's on a Dell computer. She's in R&D. Her machine has poor rep reputation because it doesn't get patched and it's been sending data out of the network. Here's an example of a well-known tool. I'm not going to say who it is, but the company begins with an L. We're looking at NetFlow traffic right here. It's an SIEM tool that basically allows you to stitch together conversa network conversations. Not one tool, not one firewall, not one IDS is going to be your panacea. If your boss tells you that, just start laughing at him and walk out. He'll enjoy it, or she will. All right? So here we see a worm is propagating your network. Why? Because it's taking advantage of a well-known Microsoft port that probably shouldn't be having traffic like that occur. Somebody had to key that in, that policy in, so it would look for it. That's the job of a security analyst. All right, so four areas I want a security analyst to focus on. Monitoring the traffic, monitoring the traffic, the network load, and the log files. Doing data analysis of those. Follow up event and alarm tuning. Going into your IPS saying, yes, I care about this signature. No, I don't. Going into your SQL server that's got all your company financial data into it, tuning that log file or getting somebody to tune it for you, and then doing incident response, following that whole pattern around and around. I know it's a boring job, but somebody's got to be doing it. If I was a well-known, uh, popular company like Walmart today, I'd be looking at my POS machines. I'd be looking at the target attack case and seeing if it could be replicated inside my network. And then where would I need to look? So start reading about those cases, set up a Google alert to send you that information and read about it, and then pretend it's happening to you and how you go find it. And then you've got to arm your security investigators. First off, they have to have a good background. They've, they're like jack of all trades, master of none. They, they got to have networking knowledge. They have to have device configuration knowledge. They have to understand about SQL databases. They have to understand about security. But then they have to understand about data management. I knew a, insurance, a law firm that was attacked up in Lakeland. And um, what the attacker did was he basically started them about three days after he was in the network, he started wiping out their their data backups. They thought they were backing up. The log said the backup was completed, but it was blank. He was writing just garbage. It was junk. He did that to basically so they couldn't restore and track him back. Then after a while, he got bored with it, and he just blew the servers all away. That law firm came this close to going out of business. They're lucky. They probably could have been sued. So... Let's look at the uh, in security investigation process. So you're the, um, you already have the one done. Now you've got to focus on the two. You've got to take all your components, feed them together to detect, collect, analyze, and then mitigate. Not an easy job. All right? You already have the box up in the upper uh, left hand, my left hand corner, prevent, or now my right hand corner. You already have that stuff. Your bosses have gone out and you've bought that stuff. The question is, are you collecting the right NetFlow and proxy log and event logs? And are you looking at that to, with an analyzer and correlating any data after it 
and are you trying to detect anything? If your IDS fires off, are you going elsewhere to look to validate the IDS was really wrong, or are you just looking at the signature going, oh, I know, that's Becky's machine, or something like that? This is where the analyst needs to be playing right there in the orange box and then t telling people to mitigate it. You can mitigate it by IP black holing that traffic. DNS poisoning is something new they're doing today. You basically go in your DNS and you redirect that DNS traffic to Bitbucket. Or you do advanced ACLs or a combination of all three. But people aren't doing the analyze enough. Nobody's looking. That's why people keep getting burned. And I've showed you two cases. I guarantee if I go through more, I'll find more out there. Okay, so the conclusion is it's a, it's a nasty world. Wild, wild west. Like the one guy uh, showed the picture of the guy. Uh, I don't know what the actor's name is, but he was in that space cowboy show in previous previous uh, presentation. So the threat landscape is rapidly changing. Business leaders must drive security. It comes from the executives on down. If they're not serious about it, the company's not serious. I usually find that the problem starts at the top and works its way down. You need uh, business challenges. You need tools, processes, and people in combination to solve this. And the security analyst has a diverse skill set and a complex problem to solve. There's not one right answer, but you need to start trying to focus on it. So, I hope that helps. All right, questions? Chirps? Beeps? Nothing? Yeah. Yeah, they have policies to start with, but they aren't really policies that are considering today's attacks. They're usually outdated. Policies take a while to get, what's the problem in most companies? Politics. Uh, somebody writes a policy, somebody in another department doesn't like it. Then that policy gets debated for 10 weeks, finally it gets implemented four months later, it's out of date. Or, or we have a policy, but we've gone and done a business partnership with this new company because the executive saw it as a good idea, that just made that policy null and void because now we're even violating our own policy. So nobody's maintaining those and saying driving those and making sure it, they don't have to have everything, all the I's and T's dotted and crossed, whatever. They just have to be there and be, they have to be fluid and moving with it. And then the people have to be, that's using those as a guide stick, have to be working them. And they're not working them. They're, they're trying to make them all to be, if I make this most comprehensive policy, we will be protected. No, that's just one part of it. You just have to start doing it. Every day you come in and say, we're going to be hacked. Is my policy in place? What happens if I am hacked? How do we respond? How does the board respond? What happens to our stock price? Question. Yeah. The insider threat used to be a high, um, high issue. And... Insider vulnerability, people bringing things in, that's always going to be one of your problems. You, you have to keep that up there. But we've seen a drop off in that, that most attacks now are coming from outside, but the insider is somehow enabling them inadvertently. So they can't be totally blamed like they're, they're a pissed off employee and so they're causing it. But that's always going to happen. So you always have to consider that. You also have policies. Uh, but what's happened was people who were insiders doing those started getting thrown in jail, and that started really dropping that off. I heard a well-known story of a guy who basically had a SQL script running that would de delete all the data, and if he didn't come into work every day, the SQL script would run, so he came into work and he would delay it till the next day because he was, knew he was going to get fired. Well, he did get fired, it blew away the server, and then he got thrown in jail, and he's still in jail today. Yeah, they're, looking, they're, they're not only looking at the data that's coming from the outside, but mostly the data that's going from the inside out from the users. That's where your vulnerability is. 
the data going out of your network, you need to be looking at that more so than the data coming in. I don't care about that. I'm worried about what's going out because that's telling me a lot more. Somebody over here? Good question. That's the, you know, that's the problem I've been trying to solve at Cisco, create like the end to be all end certification. There really isn't. Um, what I would say to be successful in this area is to take a look at my previous slide, but get really good, get some basic networking experience, Microsoft, Novell, Novell, Cisco, whatever, certified ethical hacker, take a look at that. Get a broad range. CISSP is very good for overarching, but for day-to-day -day dealing with this, a lot of that stuff on that exam, I wouldn't even uh, pertain to this. Um, so there's not really just one thing out there. That's the problem. I'm trying to create it. I'm trying to create like a cyber range where people come and sit down and I attack you and teach you how to start reading the logs, but not really getting a lot of uh, love inside of Cisco to do that. They're expensive and they don't see the ROI on it. So, But good question. It's, it's a big issue out there. Uh, who else besides certified? SANS has some good courses, but theirs are really expensive. The, what's the G, G -H, G -H -C -I? G -I -C -H? Yeah, That's a really good one to start off, but you've got to have a good solid fundamentals of networking because that course will eat you up. They have a new one security operation continuous monitoring from SANS. So I'll go take a look at it. Thanks. I just learned something. Anybody else? Nope. All right. Thank you very much. I'm up here if you need to come get my card or want to chat with me later. I appreciate it. Have a nice day.